kind of like the introduction of food trucks into Venice was um, a couple of Venice retailers got together a few years ago, and they wanted to do something called First Fridays. And first, first Friday was uh, every first Friday of the month. It was a gathering where all businesses up and down Abbot Kinney kept their doors open until 10 at night. And people would come wander down the streets and cruise through all the stores and shop. And it was just this massive social gathering. The event started, and when it first started, it was super cool, very local. Um, people cruising around, new people coming and checking out the neighborhood. And as this thing progressed, and I'm not even sure how many years we're into it now, it's probably, probably at least three years, maybe maybe even more. It All of a sudden, there was too many people down there. And what was happening was the, the different businesses started serving just wine and beer in their stores to basically have take care of the customers. It was Friday night, maybe you wanted to have a beer, and how does beer and retail go together? Well, if someone comes in and has a beer, they're more willing to maybe buy something or hang out. It's like less about of a, you know, intrusive shopping experience. So all of a sudden, all of these different places are serving alcohol down on Abikini. Well, then what? Well, nobody has a place to eat. So all of a sudden, these trucks start coming down and start kind of populating down on Abikini to feed these people that are kind of wandering around during First Friday. The first thing that happened is all of a sudden, the bars started backlashing on the retailers that were serving alcohol because they're like, these people aren't paying the fees that we're paying to have our liquor licenses. And they're basically enjoying the fruits of serving alcohol and retail monies, even though they don't have to have a, a bar. Mm. And I mean, if you look at Abikini, there, there's only like four or five bars even on Abikini. I mean, there was like thousands of people down here. I mean, you couldn't even get into the bars anyway. And it's just mm. like, here's something that local retailers started to boost business. All of a sudden, tons of people are coming to Venice. And now the bars started backlashing on the uh, retailers that were serving alcohol. And so that, that process took about two years from the time that people kind of started complaining until they, they started really kind of cracking down on businesses. Mm. It might have been shorter. It definitely moved quickly. Um, and so all of a sudden, the retailers that built this thing, now they have thousands of people every first Friday down here. They can't serve alcohol. They're kind of like, okay, did we, is this a good thing? So I, I really think that in that particular instance, the same thing is going to happen with the food trucks. Right. Um, because now they're, you know, they try to centralize them in certain parking lots, but the entire street is, is one long food truck now on first Friday. It's crazy. Wow. And, and now it's, you know, it started as being this kind of niche cool thing and is, and it's grown outside of that. But now it's, you know, I was just reading an article this morning on the New York times from a couple of days ago about like, you know, Heinz ketchup has a truck now <laughs> and ski, ski, ski resorts are using them now. Right. And fashion brands are starting to get into them now. It's like it's become the new kind of uh, you know billboard. Pop up marketing. Yeah, yeah, pop up marketing, exper- you know, experience marketing, like you're saying, social. Like, you know, if you're if you're a fan, like if you've ever had Heinz, you're like, oh, cool, the Heinz truck, and they're giving out free French fries with ketchup. Right. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a cool it's a cool idea. You know, it's like it, it gets to the point. I think when they're out circulating, there's probably still room, for, but when they're all put into one place. You know, the entire herd moves there. They're like, okay, trucks, that's, that's the new thing now. Hmm. And all it was, I think, I think it just branches all, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff just branches back to, um, you know, just the evolution and, and slight um, reinvention because, the, I mean, food trucks, food trucks have, have never really gone away. They've been here, you know, probably since the 50s. Even though that social experiment experience was always out there, they just kind of created something slightly different. And they put and they put it in that truck, um, and so now everyone, you know, everyone's kind of followed their lead and has tried to do something different. I mean, it's if it's a grilled cheese truck or if it's, um, you know, this Heinz experience or I mean, I saw I saw a post a couple of days ago for this like a lobster truck. It's like, dude, where is <laughs> when's it when's it going to end? You know what I mean? It's just like it's almost Go comical. Away. Like, wow. So when did you first sort of see it and think, wow, this is something happening here? And- do you have a favorite truck that you try and follow? Or, I mean, how does it work as, as, as a customer or a fan? I think for me, I, I, was, I would never go chase a truck down. I, I tend to get sucked into things that have cool stories. Yeah. Um, and, and the story for me about Koji, which was really cool and I thought incredibly smart, was um, you know, bringing Koji to the west side. Um, of Los Angeles. I mean, I've lived in a lot of towns over the years, and every town I've lived in that has a, a you know, in, injection of young people, um, the late night food scene 
goes like hand in hand with social and party scene. Yeah. Um, because every every place that I've lived that people go go out, they love to eat. You know, they love to eat something when the night's over. Mm-hmm. And um, where I, you know, I lived in Crested Butte, Colorado, in 1999, um, and there was nothing to do there um, after you know, kind of after hours type thing. And so two two local guys started a local sandwich place that was like late night only, and they served late night sandwiches only in this parking lot. And um, it became this massive hub of activity. And it was, the place was called Local Heroes. Um, and it was, their, their slogan was, drink early, eat late. Mm-hmm. And so like, here was two guys that came, there were two ski bombs basically that started the spot out. And this became this like, you know, epicenter of social activity post, post the eating. Um, I lived in another ski town a few years after that in Aspen, Colorado. And they had this thing called the pop co- popcorn cart that was in the middle of town. Everybody after the bars emptied out would like congregate there. <laughs> um, and I think if you go if you go back, you know, in Amer- Amer- American culture, like this, this has been happening for years. I mean, like in high schools all over the U.S., people would typically gather in like a fast food restaurant parking lot the diners, after yeah. things were happening for the night, right? Yeah. So that that kind of has existed in the psyche of. Um, you know, the, the evolution of what, what kids did. So I think from a, a happening standpoint, Koji was great in that they came up with this, you know, cool new idea and, and business owners on the West side found them and brought them to the West side and parked them, you know, in their parking lot. Um, so that, you know, people coming out of the bars are going to eat there, but it makes, it makes so much sense. It's been going on for so long. It seems so obvious, especially in a place like LA that would seem to be just on a, completely on the cut of everything happening like that. Yeah. But it, but it didn't exist. I mean, there's there's you know two or three late night dining spots on the west side. There's there's only two that are open that I know of that are open like you know till like three in the morning. And those places are typically packed on weekend nights. So it, it totally makes sense from a consumer interest standpoint. The interesting thing about Koji is you know they they kind of kicked this trend off. They created a slightly different type of food and launched and you know went from downtown LA to the west side of LA. And use, they were the first people really to use um, social media and Twitter to launch as well. Yeah. Um, and then because of that, they had they had thousands of followers. So when they were going to different places, you know, people were getting so hooked on the food. Um, and maybe the tight community because Koji was, you know, it was Korean barbecue. So, um, you know, it was the Asian community coming in kind of like gathering together as a group to go experience. I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that just hipster culture in general too was it was it was a very diverse crowd um, and something something different and people wanting to be you know in the know of something new and different. The cool thing about Koji is that so here's a couple of guys that started Koji. They started doing it. Well, the guys that ran these bars over here on the west side, specifically the Alibi on Abikini, started working there. One of the, one of the managers and the owner got together and then started talking about hey, well. They had another bar over here, which is like Culver City Mar Vista, called Alibi. And Alibi had a kind of makeshift kitchen in it where they made, you know, cheese steaks and French fries and just some basic kind of bar food items. And the place was dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. They're like, oh, so somebody change on the menu. Like, what do we do? Well, one of the managers proposed putting Koji inside this kitchen inside the Alibi. Right. So all of a sudden they, they kill the kitchen that's in there and they don't do anything. They don't change the sign outside. They don't do anything. They just instantly put Koji inside this bar. And it goes overnight from a pretty mellow place to like one of the most popular places um, on the west side. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's now Koji is operating the kitchen within that place. And then they took the chef from Koji um, and he's now operating a restaurant at a new place called A-Frame that's right down the street. So here you have a guy that came, and I'm not sure what his, what his culinary background is pre-doing Koji Truck, but now he's like, you know, one of the more progressive chefs on the west side of Los Angeles, tied into a couple different places, which started with the truck. And when they opened Alibi, they did between Yelp and Twitter, they had two, I think they had two of their trucks parked out front and the kitchen going inside and it was cr- and it was crazy for the night of the grand opening over there wow so this is kind of like a reverse engineer situation yeah totally <laughs> I mean it's, it's 
You know, it's like it's kind of like the American dream that they figured out. Like, like yeah. again, no, like that guy probably couldn't have gone in and opened a place called Koji Truck, yeah. but or, or called Koji Restaurant. Maybe he could. He could have tried, but he went this other way. They figured out the model. They figured out what people like. They figured out the social thing, and now they're going the back end and they're creating these different types of dining experiences where. You know, Koji is standard at the restaurant here, but A-Frame, you can probably look it up online. If you look at um, A-Frame on Washington Boulevard, it's it's trippy. They're doing, like, like topless, but kind of like, uh, oh, they're doing baked potato. They're doing, like, beer beer battered, like, um, chicken. They're doing, like, like almost like finger foods, but kind of yeah. like, an, again, it's another little kind of alteration on a standard, a standard uh, menu. Mm. It's it's, al- and it's cool, so. It's almost like a, you know the story of the an aspiring band. You've got to go out there and you know if you're a rock group, you've got to go out there and play the the badlands. You've got to go out and do the the grassroots thing and build up your following, and then you can sort of get back into the establishment. And it seems in a way this yep. is uh, it's quite a, it's quite a, I guess a low risk way of doing it because you know if you start out and people don't like it and you don't build a following, well, it, as you say, for fifty thousand dollars and a bit of time, it's not really a lot sunk into the the whole picture is it but this is kind of a, yeah. an interesting way that you can get yourself into the bigger establishment and i'm really curious to know how these guys built their followers up was it really just a case of having a twitter feed and taking it from there or was there a bit more to it i, I think the the front end was just word of mouth of who they were as a brand um and, and literally it's i don't know exactly how they do it but the first time i went and looked at koji on Twitter, they are they were already at thousands of followers, um, and it wasn't I mean it wasn't tens of thousands of followers. It was a, it was a couple thousand, um, but it was you know I instantly went there and was like oh it was one of those things where um, I was fairly new to Twitter when I saw it and I was just like oh, okay here's somebody that has obviously been in this mix like and they have thousands of followers and that's that's kind of strange hmm. to see a business like that have that many followers. And um, because I think the, the people that ate off the trucks were such fans that they became followers. Um, and so I think that's encouraging to other people when they go there um, to see it. Like, if, you know, if you go to a brand and you see a brand that has, that's following 2,000 people and they have 400 followers, hmm. it's kind of it's like, hmm, what's, what's going on here? Yeah. That, so, so when you go as a, from a business standpoint, you hear about Koji, you go and look at it, they have a lot of followers, whether you've gone there that night and tried them and want to know where they're at again. Because when they started, I think they only had, they had very few trucks. They had one or two trucks, I want to say. Mm-hmm. So it was like, it, they would show up fairly infrequently when they first started. It wasn't like they had, um, you know, they're showing up a couple times a week. Like, you really had to plan out where they were going to be, and you had to go there. And because they had such a limited amount of food and space on the truck, they would probably run out of food. Mm-hmm. So people started lining up for Koji, which I haven't seen for any other food truck, like an hour to two hours before Koji would even show up. Serious? Yeah. So they were, they were there so they waiting were, by the sidewalk for this thing to show up? and. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, well, I mean, look at that for a primed market of people waiting to buy your stuff, eh? And they'll wait there for yeah. hours. But do, do, do people do people know each other? Was there sort of familiar faces? I mean, how many times have you been to Koji? Would you see the same? Yeah, faces? no. The, the people, the people knew, and, and people that ate them all, you know, ate it all the time. Like some of the people in the truck would know some of the regulars. Like, hey, what's up? You know, and it's like people in line may know each other. And it was you would go down, and some days it would be an incredibly social scene with people talking. Other days it would be kind of people in their own little like you know, shells and bubbles, not really socializing too much with other people. Um, a lot of times, like, a lot of times you'd see it was at this alibi bar in in, uh, in Venice, and the bar was going on inside, so people would be coming out and just kind of, like, lining up in the smoking area, but then people would be coming out to smoke, um, so there'd be that little socialization happening back and forth, like, oh, what's going on? And talking about, you know, the truck's coming, or Cozy, what's up with this? Yeah. Especially if it was someone that was just at the bar that, didn't know what was going on, mm-hmm. um, and so that that social movement was happening through through all those functions too. And it's like, and then if you're at the bar, and and then the truck comes, and they don't even have enough food, so you can't get off, you can't eat off the truck, and 
you're like, why were those people just waiting in line? And, you know, maybe I'll go try to find them somewhere else. So I think that was kind of happening too. 